thank you very much uh, for the um, for the organisers for letting me talk to you today. Um, I'm a postdoc at the University of Liverpool. Um, however, I'm part of the Research and Residence Programme, which means that I'm currently in residence at CPI, which stands for the Centre of Process Innovation up in Darlington. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be talking to you about how we're overcoming these manufacturing barriers in the UK. So a little bit of a step back and a look at the bigger picture uh, for this talk. So the barriers facing uh, clinical uses of, of uh, phages as therapeutics in the UK, um, we kind of all are, all are kind of aware of this now. So the aim is to um, use phages clinically. However, that can't happen before um, clinical trials occur. And th this isn't happening due to the lack of regulatory framework. Um, and due to the lack of re regulatory framework, there isn't a phage market as such in the UK um, yet. And this is held back by uh, production to GMP, which isn't occurring in the in the UK. So um, the parliamentary report um, stated that um, they they know that phages can offer an alternative to combat these um, antimicrobial resistant bacteria, um, such as um, it, such as Pseudomonas, uh, which is key in chronic infections like um, such as CF. And the investment into phages has been um, hindered by a lack of clarity to route to market um, and um, infrastructure uh, for production, which is what um, this project is trying to uh, look into. And the recommendations was funding and clarity from the regulators. So um, as part, with collaboration from CPI, we're looking into the manufacturing process and trying to um, develop this this process here in the UK within a, within a GMP facility, which is um, CPI. As well as that, we are looking at this, um, this project set, set out to establish um, the regulatory framework um, in, in the manufacturing with collaboration from the MHRA. So what exactly um, constitutes GMP? I think there is a lot of confusion uh, around what GMP is and what it means. Um, and so the purpose of GMP is to minim minimize the risks uh, of producing an unsafe, ineffective, and substandard product. Uh, this is done by ensuring the as uh, all aspects of the manufacturing process are, um, control are carefully controlled, and um, the set principles behind the design, implementation, and maintenance um, of, of the quality system set. So, Basically, you're setting your own um, critical quality attributes of your product, and you need to make sure that you can show that throughout your process, they are being adhered to, to ensure the safety and um, effect, 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 effectivity of your product. And this is done by documentation, um, which means that throughout the process, everything's documented, so this can be go back to and reviewed. Uh, it's uh, validated so each of the manufacturing processes should be validated to ensure that, that um, your product is, is made consistently at the quality um, using the Q, uh, CQAs that you've established. The personnel involved are uh, in, the, in the manufacturing process itself are adequately trained um, so they know that th this procedure carries on, they're doing the documentation and they know um, each process is validated and risk assessment. So potential risks to the product quality have been identified and mitigated. So any, as, at any point in the, um, in the process, if there is a uh, divergence to that, we know what happens to the product and um, we know that um, it, it'll be okay or it won't. Um, as well as that, there is um, GMP is a phase appropriate and the regulators understand this and they know that um, coming from a research, research um, place or a, a, a small um, company, they know that you will grow during the life cycle of the product. And, and so between phase one and launch, there's going to be um, there's going to be increased understanding and this will enable you to um, apply more control uh, to your to, to your process. So um, touching on the like, regulatory framework um, and so with the MHRA, we're trying to come up with a um, guidelines for phage manufacturing um, in the UK and to ensure the safety and uh, uh, efficacy and the quality of the phages. Um, this 
number one is to make sure you've got um, highly controlled biobanks, which have um, a, a good quality of sequencing. You know that your phage that's in your biobank is exactly what you think it is. Um, it doesn't have any of these um, genes that's been discussed earlier today, um, lysogeny genes or AMR genes, um, and um, they are they're kept appropriately. The amplification of your phage, um, so that's the basics that you, you're getting the sufficient titers and they're bioactive against what you'd want them to be. Um, the purification, the checkpoint would be that the endotoxin levels are below the, thresh, uh, by, the, the, um, the threshold. The host cell proteins um, and host cell DNA are below the threshold, um, below a threshold. And again, the, uh, the titer is sufficient before going on to the next um, step. And then the quality control, um, the, 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 the third step, the final quality control would be the same as, as the original. You're making sure that the, um, the, the phage at the end is exactly what you uh, wanted. There has no, there'd be no um, phage contamination um, or any other um, extra bac bacterial DNA, DNA, et cetera, being added in. And then obviously if this, product was going into a, a human, you would have to also check the pH and sterility before it gets um, put into a human. Um, however, these, these are all great. <laughs> and this is what the sort of guidelines are going to tell that you need to check. But how exactly you check these are important, especially going into GMP. And the analytical tools to monitor these checkpoints um, are limited. And there's a lack of accuracy and uh, reliability. So uh, the roadmap to GMP um, for phage manufacturing um, is this is what we've kind of set out to, to look at on this project. We're looking at a tool, uh, toolbox of methods from upstream, upstream and downstream, downstream processing that will suit small and large scale processes. Um, from shake flask to um, classic bioreactor and the uh, selector cell maker, which is being marketed as a um, phage, phage cell maker. Um, and we can see that the shake flask has very limited control, the bioreactors much um, more control. You can monitor these better. These are what is needed for um, large scale um, GMP processing. And then moving on to the, the downstream, um, this is a five different uh, sort of um, options that could be um, taken forward. So we're trialing each of these. Um, the first one being, a um, two column process, a, um, a capture and polish. The second being the same, but with a different, um, a, a monolith column followed by a resin column. Um, this one is just the second column on its own to see if it's essential that we have the, sec uh, the first column because we want to make this accessible. If this is too expensive, um, then it's not gonna work. So these are the different options that we want to have as a toolbox so you can reach those checkpoints but it's accessible um, and we want to see when and what do we actually monitor throughout this process we want to um, sample at each of these time points um, and ensure that we're looking back at those checkpoints and ensuring we've got the, set, the right page tighter we're looking at the um, the endotoxins are at the the, the right level because it's pointless as going through the whole process to find out they're not at the end. And what are the best ways of monitoring or analyzing these? So we're um, another toolbox of analytical tools. So um, we are looking at host um, residuals, phage identity and phage stability and bioactivity, which encompasses integrity of the phage as well. Um, and most of these are previously accepted and validated methods for GMP um, and have been GM validated methods used for GMP approved biotherapeutics already. So we know that, for instance, the LAL um, endotoxin testing is a GMP approved endotoxin method. So we'd want to use that because we know that if we went to the regulators and said, this is our process and we're using a a, a very random test that hasn't been approved, it's less likely that it'll be, it'll be approved. Um, I'll, I'm going to go on to show you which ones I've tried so far and which ones I haven't, but this is the, the, the ones that we want to sort of get through uh, by the end of the project. 
So the project itself is um, the aims were to develop a key um, uh, key quality attribute package for um, using previously accepted methods for GMP therapeutics that will be transferable to, G to a GMP, GMP process. So we looked at these three uh, pseudomonas phages, PyKZ, which is a drum biophage, um, PNM, which is a uh, has a morphology of polyviridae, and uh, PELP20, which is sort of a classic uh, tailed phage. And we did this um, because we wanted to see if there are any divergences um, between the, the three dif uh, different morphologies of phages um, throughout the process. Um, and we, we started on PNM, so that. the prophage free peer one but we wanting to in the future um, and that's to reduce the potential of um, this prophage um, in and then having in your final product um, the, we know that going into these um, focusing on this num number one um, this is using a double monolith affinity column and um, at followed by uh, sorry double mon they're both monoliths um, the first one is the OH capture and second is the premarist polishing um, this is what the uh, trace looks like so we can see that um, this is the sample application um, part of the um, chromatograph and we can see that there's a, 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 a peak here this shows that there is um, residuals coming coming off so th this is the, the follow through the run through when you've captured the phages on the column um, so this shows that um, the impurities are getting um, reduced. So when it goes down here, you know that it's it's dropped off. So the, this is impurities getting removed. Um, and then we've got one peak showing the elution, which means that it's likely to be uh, one product. So if you get more than that, you might have more more than one product in your elution. And um, we're getting um, not a great yield, but this is using a one mil um, but, well, what two one mil uh, monolith columns, and we are now moving on to a larger column. Um, it's just expense. There, are, monolith columns are very expensive, and this is, again is like sort of showing you it can be done with a mo uh, one mil column. However, your binding capacity is obviously a lot lower than if you go on to a lo um, large column. Uh, then going on to the premarest column, we can see that during sample application, you aren't seeing that large peak, which means that a lot of the impurities were removed using the first column. And um, we are seeing that we've got uh, one peak here. This is the um, equilibration. So this is after we've eluted. So that's sort of uh, the, the residue that's left over. But um, this is showing one peak again, showing that you, you're likely to have um, one product coming off in the elution. Um, and we're getting sort of the same. We're not having any loss in this where, as we are in this. So this means that this um, column, uh, the binding capacity, isn't getting met. So that's that's a good thing. <laughs> um, so touching on these, these are the other two methods that I've tried. We're still yet to try uh, B and um, E. Um, so using the premarest only, we can see that there is uh, impurities um, being removed. However, when you get to the end, there's a lot of <laughs> peaks happening, and so we want to trial this again to see if this happens uh, again when you uh, when you use the premarest only. Um, however, we're thinking that the better method is using the dual um, uh, dual column method. And using D, um, which is the endotrap column, which um, I think that is a more uh, commonly used um, 
um, resin column. And this is a flow through column. So it captures your uh, endotoxin within the resin and your phages uh, flow through with a lot less endotoxin in. And so that's why the grass look a little different. And this is where you're capturing your product here. Um, we're yet to do some uh, further analysis on these two. However, I have done the endotoxin testing and um, the Premeres reduced the endotoxin by 77% and um, the endotrap alone um, removed 89%, which seems good, except when you're looking at it compared to the, the dual um, monolith um, column method A, uh, that actually removes 99.9. .9, so that is definitely the best method for endotoxin if you're just looking at endotoxin anyway. So uh, these are looking at the analytics of tools. Um, the ones that highlighted in yellow are the tools that I've, I've trialed so far and the rest I'm yet to try um, during this project. So uh, looking at the host residuals, this is a, a crude um, PNM. Um, this is sorry. This is looking at taking crude um, lysate uh, from the PNM phage, um, looking at it once it had come out of the first column, and then once it come out the second column um, using method A, um, and we can see that it significantly drops in endotoxin, and then. We also did um, the host cell protein using an ELISA for tox A, which is a pseudomonas toxin. Um, and we can see that even after the first column, it's reduced um, the uh, tox A to zero as well. So we can see that the cleanup is happening well using those two techniques, um, but I'm yet to try other ones to see if there's a sort of better method. Um, and then looking at the phage stability and bioactivity, um, we used um, DDPCR, and then we were looking at that in comparison to plaque assay. And I think um, we know that plaque assay is looking at the number of infection, of invent, effect, infection events. And we say that that is the number of phages that are there. But if we then compare that to DDPCR, which is known to overestimate how many phages there are there, yes, I get that. But um, I also did a DNA is treated one. So that is to um, combat that free DNA being in the environment. So this should be just encapsulated um, copies. We are only seeing, um, well, we can see the difference. So 4% if you compare, because this is the same sample, one DNA is treated and one not. We're getting 4% um, more phages. No, yeah. <laughs> within the um, state, so four percent copy number of um, phage DNA within the free floating that is then um, degraded by the DNAs, and then we then see it compared to the purified um, PNM phages after it's gone through the two columns. <laughs> Sorry, um, and we can see that increases as well. So that's looking at the copies. Percentage copies per um, percentage copies that cause plaques. Um, that doesn't mean that. I, I actually think the D, DDPCR is a really good way of looking at phage titer and um, and stability because if you have the two together, you can see the, the phage stability. However, um, if we think of the a plaque assay being one one phage, I think that's probably incorrect. And this is saying that it's probably getting infected by up, up to 10 phages per, per plaque. So I think that probably within a range, if you, if you have DDPCR as your, uh, as your analysis tool for tighter and keep that continuous, that can be done as long as you've got another bioactivity method. Okay. <laughs> um, and then we also did some um, dynamic light scattering which didn't really show much apart from once you've purified it, it narrows it. So, so this is kind of more um, uh, residuals. Uh, and, and in summary, <laughs> um, the regulatory guidelines uh, from the MHRA are uh, in the pipeline. Um, the paper should be coming out really soon. Um, however, they want to allow for innovation to happen. So this is allowing for flexibility and it's not a list of do's and don'ts which is, I think is what people want, but that's not going to happen. 
Um, and there's only one, there's not only one way to make GMP phages. However, you do need uh, to have a reliable way to measure your um, CQAs and um, um, so that they can be validated. Um, and better analysis, me analysis, me analysis methods are needed um, to monitor these Q uh, CQAs effectively. Um, and the manufacturing process needs to be accessible to allow us to make um, phages at different scales uh, for, for different purposes and at different budgets. Uh, I'd like to thank my supervisors and the people at CPI, um, Lee, Vicky and Charlotte that I've been working with and my funders, uh, Innovation Launchpad UK. Thanks everybody for listening.